People say we monkey around But we're too busy singing To put anybody down Good evening. Um, my name is Sarah Pascoe and I am jealous and competitive and awful. <laughs> Welcome to my radio show, Modern Monkey, about how human behaviour has been shaped by evolution, about how the lives of our ancient forebears affects our emotions and decisions now. Basically, blaming the olden days for how appalling we are. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> and we are in the Foundling Museum today, a historical home for abandoned children, a perfect example of how the best and the worst is written into human behaviour. This series is going to be exploring the darker sides of humanity, why we kill each other, why we fight for territory, before concluding with the positive, charity, altruism, why we help each other, why none of us could have survived alone. But before any of that, we are going to consider an emotion that I feel very embarrassed and ashamed of, and so it reassures me to know that it's natural. Jealousy. You know, you know when you think that something is universal and you say it out loud and you find out it's just you. So I was um, telling my friend, you know, well, you know how the eldest gets a present on the other kids' birthdays? No. <laughs> she said, I'm the eldest. <laughs> That's not a thing. But yes, so you'll have got a present on your sister's birthdays. Otherwise, you'd go mad and ruin everything because of the attention they were getting. <laughs> Um, turns out it's just my family that has this <laughs> wonderful tradition. I still get tokens in the post to distract me from any major events in my sister's lives, <laughs> even though we're all in our 30s. <laughs> when Cheryl gave birth, everyone thought I'd be jealous because I've never had a baby. Um, I have had a tapeworm, but <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> so um, my mum bought me a puppet. Uh, yeah, she, she gave it to me at the hospital so that I'd have something to play with. <laughs> it's um, a colourful parrot that squawks when you close its beak. <laughs> and I love it, and I won't let my niece play with it. <laughs> I do know I have a problem. I go green when I'm reading Twitter. Everyone bragging about how they're on holiday or eating a chocolate pudding. Like, why am I at home with no tasty snack? It's, it's not fair. Where did they get their pudding from? I want a pudding. I'm a vegan. I can't even eat chocolate pudding. I get jealous when other comedians retweet their fans saying, thanks comedian who isn't Sarah, that's the best show I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, you've not even seen my show. And if you have, you're a liar. <laughs> I take every compliment that somebody else receives as a slight to myself, no matter how removed. The ceiling of the Sistine Chapel is so beautiful. So am I. <laughs> Michelangelo is a genius. They never even gave me a chance to paint the ceiling. <laughs> How have I lost this competition? <laughs> I even get it, and this is shameful, um, I get it when people die and everyone will be kind of writing their respects and, um, and saying things like, she was the most wonderful woman I've ever met. And I'm like, well, you've never even met me. <laughs> Meet everyone before you start putting us in order of wonderfulness. <laughs> At comedy festivals, which is probably where I get it the worst, I am ferociously jealous of all other comedians because they've got better posters than me or they sell more tickets or they get these phenomenal reviews. And you know that they make festivals like Edinburgh an actual competition by giving out awards at the end, which is so unfair, because what I have noticed is that they only ever give those awards to winners. So, <laughs> I get jealous even at the Animal Bravery Awards. No, I don't like it. All of these pets get to go to a ceremony and everyone is looking at them and clapping, and why is it only me that is getting annoyed? Like, animals cannot be brave because they have no concept of death. No, no, oh, no, Sarah, that dog is brave. He jumped in front of that train to rescue that boy. He doesn't know what a train is, let alone that it can kill him. He's not even wearing clothes. He's an idiot. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, I should get all the stuff. <laughs> um, when somebody is um, better off than you, when you read about someone who has won the lottery, when Tanya from work gets her roots done, when anyone marries Mark from Take That, <laughs> you may feel the uncomfortable, anxious feeling that is jealousy. 
You might be envious of thinner women, taller men, and absolutely everyone between 19 and 26 years old. <laughs> These types of feelings have been recorded across every culture. The targets may vary between societies and individuals, but the emotion exists in everyone. We haven't all boiled a bunny, but we all recognise why she did it. <laughs> why are we so jealous? Emotions are what anthropologists would call adaptive traits. Basically, sometimes feeling a certain way can make survival more likely. The feeling encourages certain actions or responses. So, for instance, here's a good example. There's a neurotransmitter called dopamine that can make us feel good. And um, our brain gives us a little hit of dopamine when we eat, which makes eating a more pleasurable thing to do. In evolution's meal deal, we get a sandwich, a bag of crisps, and a neurochemical reward. <laughs> it's simple to see how that would incentivize our hunter-gatherer ancestors. It makes complete sense that homo sapiens who enjoyed eating the most would be more genetically successful because they're more nourished. Who ate all the pies? You ate all the pies was a very complimentary song in the Neolithic period. <laughs> Being happy when you've eaten and sad when you're very hungry are adaptive emotions. So, like how the pleasure of eating encourages us to do it, the displeasure of jealousy, of noticing that other people have more than we do, motivates us to do better. Evolution is a competition. You have to notice who is winning in order to compete with them. And it doesn't feel nice to lose, otherwise we'd all just sit down and give up. Our species would be over. It is the competitiveness of our nature which keeps our species alive. Evolutionary psychologists. I know evolutionary psychologist doesn't sound like a real thing. I imagine people putting old skeletons on a chaise long and asking them, and how does that make you feel? But apparently it is a real job and they can afford real lawyers and I'm very sorry about my ill-researched panorama expose. <laughs> Evolutionary psychologists theorise which of our traits have been naturally or sexually selected for. What is the difference? I hear you screaming at your stereo. <laughs> naturally selected traits are things that make us better at staying alive longer. Sexually selected traits make us better at reproducing. Some adaptations might be both. Like having a fit, muscly, symmetrical body is very useful for lifting delicious fruits or running away from predators. It's also very sexy as an indicator of health. It's a shame this is radio and you can't see me wiggling my symmetrical and delicious fruits. <laughs> Both natural... <laughs> they were laughing because it's so true. <laughs> Both natural selection and sexual selection are relevant when considering jealousy. We'll deal with natural selection first. When it comes to survival of the fittest, resources are very important. Now, we only ever hear that word nowadays as part of human resources, which is a woman called Anne who does your paycheck and brings in cake on Fridays. No one's jealous of Anne. Her life stinks. Um, in evolutionary terms... Resources means all stuff. Food, weapons, status signifiers. We notice what other people have and we want it for ourselves because, consciously or not, we are competing with those around us for survival. In the Bible, original title, I'm God and this is my story. <laughs> Moses collects ten commandments etched onto stone tablets. God got the idea from Ed Miliband, but... <laughs> made fun of God because he has a much higher popularity rating <laughs> and because if anyone makes fun of how God eats bacon sandwiches he shouts I invented bacon sandwiches and everyone apologizes and bows the Ten Commandments include some really cool rules for life like never eat yellow snow and never wear white before Labor Day but it also has instructions like Honour your parents, which is tricky when one of them is a jazz musician with long hair and your mother fell in love with a con man who said his name was Kevan. <laughs> Kevan. Of course he was a con man. It's the worst fake name I've ever heard. <laughs> Guys, if you ever fall for someone so obviously a con man, then I'm sorry, Mum, but you deserve to have your car stolen. <laughs> the rule we're here for, though, is thou shalt not covet thou neighbour's ass. 
It means donkey in this instance, but it could also be referring to Linda's cute behind and still be meaningful. Wishing you had what your neighbours have got can only lead to unhappy feelings of discontentment. If God does write a sequel, title Don't Stop Believing, then I am sure, then I am sure there will be more body positivity included. Thou shalt love the butt I gave you. It's very relevant that the commandment said neighbour, as studies show that you're much more likely to be jealous of people in close proximity. When I was growing up, everybody on my road in Romford was obsessed with pebble dashing. Right, the, the Turners got it for their house in 1989, and then one by one, everyone saved up and got their council house slathered with cement and tiny stones, because not to do it was a sign of losing or being lesser, of not being able to provide. Inside rational human beings, there is an animal whose competitive nature overrides the fact that pebble dashing looks awful. <laughs> then, in 1992, after the whole of Marshall's Drive looked like Brighton Beach had puked on it, <laughs> the Millers got crazy paving and the terrible home improvement cycle started again. I don't get jealous of stuff. I've never really coveted things. My weakness is ambition. Um, I recently had a, a coffee with Anne. Now, Anne was my best friend when I was 14. I always knew you would be successful, she said. Oh, that was nice. Most people say what a surprise it is and how I was never funny as a child. <laughs> Don't they, Mum? <laughs> did, um, did I have that special, unnameable star quality? I asked Anne. <laughs> no. She said, but it was clear you would stop at nothing to get what you wanted. <laughs> Anne went on to remind me about how she'd got a part in the play at our local theatre, and I had responded by mutilating all of the posters with her face on and <laughs> stolen her costume, hoping I'd be called to replace her. <laughs> what a bitch! <laughs> Why would she tell me that? <laughs> Jealousy, I suppose. <laughs> I've got a Radio 4 series and she's stuck in human resources. <laughs> I used to be very jealous of my sister Cheryl, um, which in evolutionary terms is quite complex. Since a brother or sister shares half our genes, theoretically we should be less jealous of them. But our siblings are also in direct competition for the food and protection offered by parents, so we're downed right to fight with them. Cheryl and I went to the same drama club, and she was much more talented than me and didn't cry all the time. I couldn't bear it. Now, of course, I am mature and reasonable and so proud of her because she's quit show business and <laughs> doesn't even have a puppet. <laughs> Psychologists like David Buss claim that the closer we are to someone, the more difficult we might find their achievements. This is well summed up by that Morrissey song, We Hate It When Our Friends Become Successful. Morrissey has been very kind to his friends by being rubbish for ages. <laughs> While um, jealousy is an emotion that we've all felt, it is not a nice feeling to be jealous. It might have been a valuable trait tens of thousands of years ago, but I don't like it in myself. And while I've been joking around so far, there is a very dangerous side to extreme jealousy, which brings us to Othello syndrome. When I began researching jealousy, the first thing that came up on the internet was Othello syndrome. And I thought, well, I know what that is. It's when your friend gets cast as Othello and you're furious. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even see me for that. <laughs> Othello syndrome, named after the Shakespearean character who doubts his faithful wife and murders her, is what happens when the obsessively jealous treats people like objects. I'm not pathological, but I can be very possessive and needy. I call my relationship style Kim Jong-il, uh, <laughs> after the North Korean dictator. <laughs> now, I, know, I do know that he was a terrible man who did terrible things, but he has my secret sympathy because he had the insecurity level of a woman in a new relationship. He lied about his age, he claimed he didn't go to the toilet, and he asked people what they were thinking all the time so that he could punish them for it. <laughs> Kim Jong-il invented thought crime because he understood that if you really loved somebody or your subjects, then they have the power to hurt you and you must suppress them. Hear the tension in the room as I appear to defend the behaviour of Kim Jong-il. 
I'll give you an example. Uh, Facebook. Facebook, I used to think, was a great website. It's handy for staying in touch and things. Now it is my enemy, because if my boyfriend is in another room and he shouts out, you didn't tell me that Katie went to Tunisia. Now, that might sound innocent enough, but she went to Tunisia in 2009 and is my most beautiful friend, <laughs> which means that he has gone back through eight years of photographs <laughs> to find one of her in a bikini. <laughs> and technically, of course, there's nothing like technically wrong with that, but it's a thoughts crime <laughs> and it's not fair. In the olden days before Facebook, if a guy fancied a lady and wanted to see a picture of her in a swimming costume, he had to open a snappy snaps near her house and <laughs> hope that she came in after her holidays. <laughs> I, um, I would love to be a dictator, by the way. <laughs> I'd love it. I think I'd be brilliant. I think you should all vote for me in your last act of democracy. <laughs> and I'll ban Facebook, I'll sack Anne, and receive presents on all your birthdays. <laughs> the internet has made thought crime too easy. I have this idea that whenever you start going out with someone, you should be able to scan your picture into their computer, and then if ever they look at pornography, which is their right, then all of the banner ads would have your face on them. <laughs> Fun! <laughs> we could customise them. <laughs> Women waiting for you to put the bins out in your area. <laughs> exaggerating, but mm, just a bit, <laughs> just a little bit. I don't like feeling like this, and that's why I want to understand where, where these feelings come from. Um, uh, we've recorded at Sigmund Freud's house this series, and it's a museum to a man who spoke at length about jealousy. Freud explained how it is never a rational emotion. We don't consciously look at things and decide that we want them. It happens at a subconscious level. He understood that the pangs of jealousy could be motivational in gaining more stuff, in remaining competitive. So here, his theories match up with the evolutionary psychologist. Now, though, we're going to work through the purpose of romantic jealousy. Freud has stated that children are jealous of one parent because they subconsciously wish to be romantically involved with the other. And he said that women envy men's penises. So mm -hmm. let's just say... Thanks for your help, Freud. And back away slowly. <laughs> to understand romantic jealousy, we have to go back in time two million years. We have to consider the physical changes that affected our species. Our brain began to get bigger. Our skull grew. The human brain is between five to seven times as big as you would expect for a mammal our size. So this was quite an expansion. We had a much bigger head probably need much bigger hips to give birth, eh, ladies? Nah. -ah. <laughs> Becoming bipedal had shrunk the hips of Homo sapiens. They became much narrower in order to support the upper body and enabling us to run quickly and walk all day. This adaptation wasn't just so we could see the world and invent the Olympics. It made us much more efficient at hunting, finding food and escaping predators. And along with this massive new neural machinery, we could communicate better with each other, take over the world, and become the super species you see before you today. <laughs> they were supposed to applaud me here as the pinnacle of humanity and the end of evolution. Ironically, I think this audience were quite jealous of me. So, women have slim hips and babies have big skulls. Thanks, evolution. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> this physical impossibility means that if babies were to go full term in utero, if they were to grow to the stage of development of any other mammal, which would be a gestation of about 2.5 years, then all women would be smashed to smithereens by birthing them. No one would have a mother. Goodbye, species. An evolutionary compromise was made. Human babies are gestated for only nine months, the very beginning of their growth, and then they are birthed early with soft skulls that aren't finished. They have holes in. Childbirth is still the most dangerous thing a woman can do, but these smaller, part-baked babies mean that most will survive. But there are ramifications. So if you compare us to chimpanzees, when the female chimpanzee gives birth, it takes her about half an hour. She does it unassisted. And the baby is equivalent to a human toddler. It could do lots of things straight away, like hold its own head and grip. So she just shoves him on her back and then swings off through the forest to the baby shower. 
<laughs> Human babies are useless. They just lie there. He won't be able to hold his own head up for a year. Human babies are growing their brain at an exponential rate. It's 1% a day for the first three months. It means they need a huge amount of nutrients provided by the mother's body via lactation. It also means that one person cannot keep a baby alive on her own. Two parented bonds became necessary. Families became necessary. Sharing between families and nurturing all the children of the tribe became necessary. Also, going flipping mental if the person you were pair bonded with was sleeping with people behind your back became <laughs> necessary. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Romantic jealousy, I think this is very interesting, is gendered. We have different reasons to be aware of where our partner's affections are going because of the differences in parental investment. Now, it's a good time for me to just mention that when talking about evolution, it can sometimes seem like you're assuming that everyone's heterosexual because uh, it's a male body and a female body that makes a child. But obviously, gay people pair bond very closely as well. It's exactly the same mechanics and circuitry that's going on. A very heteronormative evolution. It's one of my criticisms. So, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll write to them. So, uh, <laughs> a stern word from me, please. Um, so, the theory goes that for a female, pair bonded with a male and relying on his input of time, protection, and resources for raising a child, if he has another family or multiple partners, his time and his resources will be split. Evolutionary psychologists tell us that women are programmed to be more jealous of whether their partner has feelings for someone else rather than whether he's had sex with them. There was this, um, by David Buss actually, this cross-cultural study that found that women were more worried about emotional cheating than sexual cheating, which I find so hard to believe, but there we go. Sometimes studies do not conform to our own subjective beliefs, and that's the soft sciences. <laughs> I still can't believe that this is true. No one has ever made you feel less jealous by going, don't worry, darling, I only had sex with her. This study found that men were much more bothered about whether their female partner had sexually cheated than emotionally. Apparently, in terms of arousal, men and women get aroused almost at kind of similar rates in terms of it's an ascending uh, line, going upwards, getting more and more aroused. At climax, a male's arousal plummets straight away and actually he gets very sleepy he becomes quite soporific and the evolutionary theory is that this is so that males don't stop females leaving that he just kind of goes to sleep and can't fight anyone that she can go off females get aroused climax stay at that arousal level and the evolutionary theory is so she leaves so that she's just like okay i'll see what else is out there um, and, and she can she can mate happily with other people also um through every single culture that they've studied, women are more vocal during sex than men. They make a lot more noise. And they used to have this theory that was like, they always do this where they're like, oh, women do it because men like it. Um, but now they think that um, it's actually a woman's way of signalling to local men in the area <laughs> that she's available. <laughs> like, so essentially what she's saying, oh, hang on, mate, you'll be asleep in a minute. <laughs> I know. So I think these things are really exciting and brilliant. But what they mean in terms of us as a species is there's two ways that we can be kind of um, genetic losers in our children. So if you, if you imagine, you always have to imagine that we evolved for a time that isn't like this. We are conscious, we make decisions, we have advances in science. Our life is different, but our bodies are the same. A man pair bonded with a female has no paternity certainty. Women can be sure that the children they birth are theirs. They are investing into their own genetic success. If the female has copulated with one or more males, a man risks investing into the success of a rival's genes. Now, the female body has evolved to confuse this further. We have concealed ovulation. We have sex throughout our cycle and do not signal when we are fertile like the other apes. We don't wave our ripe pink bums about unless it's a really good party. <laughs> This means that a male cannot guard his partner during the two days that she may be impregnated. This is massive. As I said earlier, our huge brain means that we need to pair bond very deeply in order for children to survive into adulthood. But that doesn't mean that we pair bond monogamously. For males, the ideal situation may be to pair bond and then have some extra sex outside of the relationship for an extra chance at genetic success. Perhaps there will be another male foolishly raising his offspring. Similarly, for females, 
Having offspring by different males would give her children a wider range of genes than mating with one. It could be of benefit to her to remain deeply pair-bonded but have some sex outside of the relationship as a kind of genetic spread betting. Now, I'm not trying to give you excuses for cheating, by the way. <laughs> Don't you come back late from the wine bar saying, I was genetic spread betting, <laughs> and break his heart. I know it can seem so reductive to talk about humans like we're animals, because the massive brain we grew does mean that we are more than that. We weigh up our decisions. We know what we're doing. But part of that, I think, means understanding where some of what Freud would call our subconscious desires come from. Thou shalt not commit adultery was in the commandments because, like coveting your neighbor's stuff, it is something that we are likely to want to do. Knowing we are a bit animal can help us forgive ourselves for the feelings, or at least that's my hope. But there's a really serious side to this. 94% of women in shelters say that some or all of their partner's violence stemmed from jealousy. Married women are nine times more likely to be murdered by a partner than a stranger. Across the world, you can see the male attempts to suppress female sexuality out of fear, from FGM to slut-shaming, from religious doctrine and guilt to the actual oppression of intimate partner violence. Up until the 1970s, the cookhold's defense was a valid excuse for murder. Like, if a man came home and found his wife in bed with someone and he killed her, the law was like, yeah... What else would you do? <laughs> like, it's uh, so shocking. This bestial aspect of human nature is horrifying, but I think we have to understand where it comes from in order to improve. When you think of evolution, for millennia, human beings lived in tribes of between 60 and 150, small groups. Our competition was limited. Our neighbours were it. Like, sure, Linda had a nice butt, but mirrors weren't even invented for you to see that yours is saggy and covered in boils. <laughs> the modern world has sent our inbuilt proclivity for envy haywire. Suddenly we were in competition with billions of people and we will lose. But you have to remember, if you can, that intellectually, it's a synthetic competition. We have everything we need to survive. We are enough. You are enough. I would like to dedicate this program to Cheryl and apologise for things that I say about her in later episodes. <laughs> Good night. Yeah,